All righty. Does everyone see my screen okay there? Looking good. Good to go, Houston. Perfect. Well, great. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, it's great to do this uh, finally. Um, it's, I'm always on the accelerator, but I'm often too busy working away over here and not able to actually kind of chat and join. So I'm more of a listening in, but this is a great opportunity to really sort of touch base. So uh, I'm a little fear, fearful that I've got way too many slides. So I'm going to try and whiz through. Um, I'm going to try and avoid talking about the architecture as much as that kills me. So I'm going to try and hop over that and maybe we'll touch on that some more, go back to it in the uh, the after hour. But uh, I'll try and get through the basics of the building and then get into the nitty gritty uh, as quick as I can. All right. Okay, so just a quick rundown of our project team here. Um, Project's been uh, developers Dimex Group. Uh, the main guys kind of involved really that we'll talk about on this presentation is Integral, the mechanical and electrical engineers. Um, and I'll just keep on going. Uh, so fundamentally, it's a 60 unit residential apartment and townhouse development in East Vancouver in BC. It's uh, fundamentally, it's four buildings orientated around a central courtyard in a hybrid arrangement of four stacked, uh, four story stacked apartments at the front of the site and three story townhouses along the back. Uh, mixes of one, two and three bed suites uh, with two bed lock offs to the front building, uh, an FSR around about 1.58 of 57 and a half thousand square feet. Um, stacked apartments at the front of the more interesting building that's got uh, stacked units access from level one and two and then a walkway at level three to access the third and fourth floor um, and then a single level parkade is underneath that which has a well mechanical electrical and bike parking in <clears throat> the zone itself is rm12 but this is the hybrid form which is 12n uh, which allows 1.45 to about 1.7 fsr um, and in this case apartments and townhouses uh, up to three and four stories um, there were City of Vancouver um, incentives for this, like the 5% density bonus. Um, although that's a little confused on this project because of the hybrid zone. Um, and of course, the City of Vancouver also has the wall thickness exclusion allowance for those thicker walls. Uh, so fundamentally, it's broken down into building 1A and 1B, which I'll refer to more often as building 1. Building 2 in, in the southwest corner, there, which is a three-story unit. And building 3 and 4, again, more three-story townhouses along the back view of it there from the front of the building one along the front there. Um, the central courtyard is really aimed at being the primary route to really get people to interact and access most of the units uh, with access off East First and off Templeton Drive at the other end. Uh, and there's some common gathering spaces as well to try and add to that kind of community feel. Um, there is a level one, building one across the front and two and three, four along the back. Uh, building one really, the um, it challenged those design uh, expectations by doing this four-story apartment format with 40 units um, with level one and two access from grade and level three and four access from a common walkway and elevator um, up on uh, level three. Um, they're compact and, official, um, and efficient units. Um, uh, the mixtures of the two and three beds predominantly for this unit um, with the level one units offering uh, lock-off units as like a mortgage helper. Um, the fourth story that we'll get up to in a second, that's you can see the format of the Two levels there, the walkway, and then the fourth floor above. There's level two. Level three, that's the walkway with the elevator, which serves level three and four above. And there's level four. Um, that's accessed primarily by this elevator in the middle, which splits the building into two. And the stair behind that access from the courtyard gives you the stair, the stepped access as well. Um, the building was broken into two blocks, predominantly because of the um, limitations on building frontage under the zoning. Um, then we had to provide uh, exit stairs for the limitations of exiting, um, which separates kind of the building from being fundamentally two buildings to having these two end detached units as well. Um, the nice thing about this building using on East First is also the fact that it's uh, you get double aspect looking, but all the units run front to back. Um, and also acts as a nice sound barrier to separate from the busy First Avenue to the courtyard and the other townhouses behind. That's just a little view there of how those units look from the, the back. So they really they kind of uh, have that kind of apartment feel with the balconies. And there's the stairs separating those detached units on the end. And there's a couple of elevations from the, from the front and the back. And then from the two sides there. It's got a little, oh, there we go, a little pause. Um, so there's a little block there of those levels one and two. You can see how you've got the stepped access um, from the courtyards at level one for the level one units and the level twos step up from East First Avenue in the front and are stacked. Uh, and the level three units access from those stairs separating the units. And again, then stacking up 
to level four. The section there helps explain kind of really how those units come together. And those are the circulations, the stairs and the elevators. And then the long section coming through. Alrighty, building two, um, this is a more conventional um, uh, one level apartment, uh, one bed apartments at the ground floor, uh, and then three three story uh, townhouses uh, above. And then again, another stacked arrangement. Um, you can see there in the section. Um, we did originally have, um, uh, we had a full third story, um, but unfortunately, because of some slightly strange City of Vancouver DCL waiver policies that cap your FSR 1.5 under medium density. It basically meant that because we were above 1.5, it meant it was going to basically cost a fortune. <laughs> so the we basically had no choice other than to make the make the project still financially viable. So it was actually cut area out the building, which meant for this guy, it meant taking off the third floor and turning it into this roof, kind of large roof area that you can see on the right hand side there with just a stair access up. Again, kind of messed up a building envelope from a passive house point of view. Massive view of it there. Um, Building three and four, which runs along the back of the site, more conventional three-story um, townhouses, three-bed units. That's all view of them from the rear. And that's the upper level. And we have this kind of uh, separated in the middle again because of this requirement for the frontage limitations. Um, then we've got this slightly odd unit that's in yellow there, which is the unit that goes above the, the parquet ramp. And then those are the master suites on the top floor, which make these nice nice roof decks. Um, unfortunately, you know, ideally, we'd like to have those to be a more conventional square shape. Um, but again, we've got limited by this 60% rule of the fact that the, the third floor needs to be 60% of the, uh, the, the, the floor below. And there it is in section just to help kind of understand that. And then they've got kind of these nice entries kind of with the uh, landscaping around them off the courtyard. Okay, so the nitty gritty, the passive house side stuff. Okay, um, ventilation. Um, so we looked at the uh, cent uh, centralized HIV setups. Um, typically, uh, it's good for central control and good for a central point of maintenance. And you have that high ventilation rates that give you lots of capacity. Um, problem is it's really better suited to uh, multifamily apartments and large, larger scale projects. Um, and also rental, because you need those common areas to be able to access those uh, common shared um, uh, systems. Um, Semi-central, very similar. It could have been an opportunity to do it maybe on the front building for building one because of the way it's stacked. Um, but under the cons, it's really, it was really quite a challenge to find a common shaft that would run through from level one through to four um, and not kind of basically mess up your floor plan. Uh, we ended up settling on having individual HIVs. So um, they're better suited to individual ownership um, they're well suited to townhouses as a general kind of form. Um, we're able to size each HRV to each unit. Um, the owners will then be able to control the, uh, any boosting or bypass to try and get that night flush. Um, the, most of the HRVs are located in either washrooms or storage rooms up in the ceiling if we can. Um, and the exterior ducting can be short by having individual HRVs um, and, and they have to be maintained by the owners. Uh, the strategy works out to be um, we have one bed units using the Zender CA 200s uh, and the bigger units, the two and three beds use the CA 350s, um, again, stored in the washrooms or the storeroom ceilings. Um, the hard ducting to the exterior uh, uses four inches of insulation, um, and then we use the three inch ComfoFlex pipes to distribute um, within the suites within drop ceilings. Um, the, we do have a bit of a typical challenge of trying to get that separation between the of ideally eight to 10 feet. Um, but we do question kind of how that really works when fundamentally it's your, it's the air from your own suite. So is that really contamination? That's certainly a discussion where we often have. Um, and then we are always typically hitting that challenge of trying to hit those PHI ventilation rates, but also getting it to work from an ASHRAE point of view. Um, the heating and cooling options. Um, we looked at um, these combined units, which you guys have seen a lot on here, um, particularly the Minotaur as their uh, sponsors. Um, great units, compact all in one, very easy installs, um, on demand heating and cooling. Um, nice things you don't need any outdoor condensers, um, and you can have efficient short refrigeration runs. Um, the, we did have issues with modeling, um, particularly with the Innova units. We like the look of those, but trying to get data out of Italy seems to be very difficult, um, and trying to get the city to the IPHPP and understand how we're modeling it and the certification issues with that. Um, and from a client point of view, they understand that it's not really full AC and they have concerns about whether it's just tempering cooling and not 
um, uh, not enough cooling. Um, but in a passive house, you know, that's, that's a debatable thing. And also just the unfamiliarity because they haven't been in the market that long. Um, the other options also very, um, and in this case, could, could have been in-stream heating and cooling. Um, again, very efficient because the heat pump's running it. Um, it's almost full AC, uh, depending on kind of what kind of tonnage you can deliver. Um, uh, single cores for whole projects or the whole unit. Um, the scale is again slightly better suited to um, to apartment buildings uh, rather than individual townhouses, but depending on the setup you choose. Um, again, no individual control if it is a central one, um, and needing those common service spaces um, and the potential issue of having refrigerants and the type of refrigerant that it is and the global warming potential of those. Um, shading. Um, we did look initially at uh, automated. Um, automated blinds. Uh, we have some quite big build, uh, windows on this and at the time they were designed with the intent of having exterior blinds but um, they're great because they are low energy use. Can we have them being automated or uh, manually controlled? Um, but they were looking a little bit expensive at the time of design um, and the detailing of how you prevent the thermal bridging. Um, we ended up settling and providing some breeze soleil on the south side of the building. You can see in the image there on the right hand side just to shade the bedrooms on the second floor of the back of the building. Um, nice and simple, um, could say dumb in many respects, because they don't give you a lot of control over that solar heat gate. Um, the cooling option we settled on was actually AC roughing with baseboard heaters. So um, we're mounting, we're putting curbs on the roofs um, and the, the service of the power and everything is gonna be roughed in uh, at construction. And the purchasers are gonna have the opportunity to put in one, two or three heads in the bedrooms and the living spaces um, at the time of purchase or because it's being plumbed in, you can have, you can install those later yourself. Um, the baseboard heaters then in the bedrooms and the living rooms. Um, Unfortunately, there's no smart control between these systems because the fact that we might, they might install them or they not, might not install them. Um, so there is a bit of user education we'll try and provide to the, uh, to the homeowners so that you don't just overlap and have the heating being churned out on the baseboard and having the cooling coming out of the AC. Uh, you do get the overheating prevention with the AC um, and you have the uh, manual auto control. Um, again, there is some cost, but it, that's from the client's point of view, this worked out to be the most cost effective option for this project. Um, okay, so the nitty gritty of how we actually plan these out. So um, this is an example of building one, which is the, the stacked, um, stacked apartments, um, showing the level one two bed with the lock off suite. On the right hand side there, you can see the slight blow up of it. Um, so these units type to have the HRVs in the washrooms. Um, the silence is located just outside the washroom in the corridor in a drop ceiling. Um, and we use the Comfort Flex pipes to distribute from the, um, uh, from the silence boxes to the rest of the suite. Uh, the adding complication for this is because of the lock-off suite, um, we have to run tin ducting uh, from, the, from the silencer unit into that suite uh, because we have to have a fire damper on it. And there's all sorts of code issues about do you or don't you need a smoke damper, but that's kind of more specific to, to Vancouver than sort of the wider field. Um, example of a, a level two three-bed unit, um, and the bigger one using the, the, uh, the, three, the CA350, um, again, similar, similar layout. The reason I've shown the one on the right hand side is because although the units are, the layouts are very similar, obviously when it's, uh, when it's, uh, set, when it's a unit in the middle of a, like a row house set up like the one on the right hand side, you've got to have a slightly different um, exterior run for the, for the ducts. And as you can see there in the bedroom, we've got the um, supply running down one side of the bedroom, the exhaust running down the other. So we've got slightly um, fussy drop ceilings going on, but it was a number of back and forths trying to figure out the best way to run those. Uh, another example of a, um, the level four. So the, the level four is slightly different because it's a one bed suite. Um, so it's using the smaller CA200s. Um, again, we've got the, uh, in this location, the ERVs are located really close to the exterior walls. So they've got nice efficient runs. Um, and again, the Comfort Flex type um, ducting running around the rest of the suite. Uh, the, these are the, the level one uh, units for the one beds in the, in the townhouses, uh, sorry, in the, the apartments on building two, and also the three-story townhouse uh, to the right hand side there. Um, uh, exactly the same setup. Again, you've got the HRV in the closet in this instance, in the bedroom, um, with a short run to the outside. Um, and then in the townhouse using the uh, two by four, there's a bit of debate still about whether you can fit Comfort Flex pipes in a two by four wall. Some people told me yes, some people tell me you need two by six, bit of a debate. Uh, we'll see as this one moves forward. And these are just some of the other ones as well. Again, you can see how those runs uh, run around the ceiling in the drop and then go down a, uh, down a wall. So the HRV is located in the middle floor, so then they distribute up and down to be the shortest possible runs.
Uh, moving on to domestic hot water, um, uh, the we looked at the option of having a central system, but the, there wasn't really, again, any central kind of common space we could do it, and we were limited for space in the parkade. And um, there were some cost implications as well, and the length of the research lines for that system. And certainly, gas is not an option for this project, electric only. Um, so the choice of the sand and heat pumps, um, very very efficient COP, a three and a half, three, three and a half to four. Um, we've got four mechanical rooms in the parkade. Um, we're typically grouping them together and we've got gives us flexibility as to where they can go in the parkade um, and very easy maintenance and because in the parkade less risk of freezing um, and we can position them uh, conveniently so we've kind of positioned them around the parkade so they're closer to the specific buildings and they basically feed each um, each building is fed by their local mechanical room uh, so in blue there is where kind of the heat pumps are located on the walls uh, here's the schematic of the uh, domestic hot water. I don't know if Scott wants to jump in here as I've been ranting away. He, he loves the hot water. So. <laughs> uh, anybody who, uh, we're, we're big fans of the sand and heat pumps for domestic hot water. And we're using them even in non-pacifos projects. And Vancouver has basically just legislated that we are no longer allowed to use um, gas for domestic hot water. And the single family houses are not gonna be able to use gas either. So. Uh, Vancouver is moving along pretty fast. Uh, and what we're finding is these sand and heat pumps. I saw a little article on Twitter today that actually showed in most Canadian cities, heat pumps are going to be cheaper than gas at today's gas prices. So that was really interesting. Um, so if anybody doesn't know how this system works, basically, you, you're, where, you're at the far end, there's a tank, which is the coldest of the tanks. That's where the incoming water supply will come from the city, uh, cold water, um, that's ST11 there. And what happens is the sand and heat pump will take the water out of the bottom of that tank, which is the coldest place in the tank, run it through the heat pump, and then it'll deposit in the top of the farthest tank. And what happens then is that farthest tank then uh, goes as there's a demand in the system it'll move that water into the final tank which is ewh4 which is an electric hot water tank and that tank is there has got electric resistance it's not a and the purpose of the electric resistance is just to make up the little bit of losses that you get in the domestic hot water as it recirculates around the building so in the morning it's not going to matter because what's going to happen is that that sand and tank is going to deliver about 150 degree water into the top of that electric hot water tank. And we're gonna set that temperature of that electric hot water tank at about a 130 degrees. So what happens is as the water leaves that, it's gonna leave that somewhere. Well, this, this says 145 degrees. Uh, it's gonna go into that mixing valve, which will mix it down to about 140 degrees. Then it'll circulate around the building. It'll come back at, if it comes back at less than 130 degrees and there's no demand putting 140 degree water, or 150 degree water in the top of the tank, then that electric water heater will just kick on just to make up maybe five, 10 degrees in that water temperature, just to bring it back up to 130. Uh, that's usually how they're set up. Now this says 140, but something like that. Anyway, that's the way the system will work. And we found that that's the best way to, to do the makeup uh, from the hot water system on the research. Anyways, thanks. See, told you, he loves the stuff. Right. You've now eaten up all my time. So now I've got to it. All righty. Um, we also have air admittance valves on this project. It um, uh, was a big issue for us in the very first early days when we first started doing passive house on multifamilies. Um, great for eliminating thermal bridges through the through the roof. Um, very, very reliable. We're using them in cold climates up in Smithers as well as uh, locally in the lower mainland. Uh, and they are basically plumbed just the same as a standard vented system, but um, you have an AAV on uh, on groups. And as you can see, there's um, uh, four, you four all feeding into to one vent. Um, now onto the envelope. Um, so to pass about, so it's high performance assemblies. Uh, we've got around about R45 for the typical wall assembly, R62 for the roof. R48 for the floor to the parkade, R4 again for R48 for its um, to the ground plane. Um, there are some thermal bridges, but again, those are accounted for in PHPP. Uh, the exterior wall itself is typically a six inch uh, EFIS um, system on a two by six wall. Um, the particular finish we're having actually is uh, at the moment, it's kind of still out of tender at the moment, but it's um, at the moment it's spec as this ADEX RS um, or XNC system, which is six inches of insulation, either EPS or rock wall, uh, sorry, rock wall, uh, depending on kind of which uh, what code requirements you have for um, 
uh, spatial separation and, and combustibility. Um, it's spatially efficient, uh, it's cost effective, uh, nice simple air barrier on the face of the plywood. Um, it's a relatively fam uh, familiar construction method locally here. Um, and again, it's flexible from a material point of view in terms of if you do change out that exterior finishing product, uh, you can use a different kind of air barrier, whether it's going to be a liquid applied or a membrane on the face of that plywood. Um, I see the this is just a diagram that we've put together for to indicate where our air barrier is in planning section there that's typical building one. Uh, this is the example of the ADEX system itself Here's one of our typical um, uh, through all flashing details. Um, you can see that we've still got a little bit of um, spray foam where it's needed. Um, uh, just going to prevent that thermal bridging really kind of cap it off. Um, and we do, we'll have standard flashing is kind of breaking through where, the, where each floor is. Uh, typical interior and ex sorry, external inter internal corners. Um, now, on this project, we've got a few steps kind of occurring where we've got things like the parkade ramp. Um, so in this instance, in the parkade, we've got around about five inches of mon sprayed monoglass on the underside, and we've gone for a split insulation system. So then we have um, uh, between four and six inches of insulation on top of the slab. Um, at the moment, we're specking that as EPS, but on some of our projects lately, actually the contractors have preferred using, um, admittedly this was in a commercial setup, they actually preferred to use um, spray foam uh, and then using a leveling screed on top to make it uh, for a smooth finish. Uh, typical soffit detail there. Um, again, the advantage of using this um, uh, stucco ADEX system is that uh, it's then one trade for the entire project. You know, on other projects, typically we can, if you want a, a pattern or you want a solid color, you can use Hardy. Um, but with the ADEX system, I should really put a diagram in, but basically you can, you can provide stencils with it so you can give it a pattern. Um, on some of those 3D images, you might have seen some of the um, basics or pattern lines forming. And again, that's just from a stencil that they actually pour on, do, the, do one scratch coat, peel it off and then do a finishing coat. Um, so that's one system to run in all conditions where the horizontal or vertical. Um, so it gives you lots of flexibility in one trade. So it's nice and efficient. Um, what is some of our typical deck details? Uh, in these instances, you can see where we've got the, uh, it's pretty good for thermally isolating um, our, uh, our, our connections to things like uh, privacy screens. Uh, we typically have this little upstand just to provide that six inches kind of protection from uh, from where the water's landing and spraying up the wall. Um, and we've actually elected to basically provide a metal cap that will cover that. So it means it kind of uh, try and protect that EPS from kind of getting dented in the stucco, again, not from getting scratched and kind of chipped off. Uh, typical um, deck detail, as you can see, in some cases, we do have to um, step the ceiling down. Um, we'll use thinner framing. Um, so we've typically got 11 by 7 eighths in the floor, and then we'll go to 2 by 8 or something like that at the decks just to make up that extra insulation. And as you see, it's a little tricky with how you can get your, um, your air barrier in, so you've really got to look at these details um, and figure out how, like, where you're pre-stripping and where you're building wood curbs and things like that. Um, typical deck in this particular situation, uh, this is where we've got the walkway. Uh, they really didn't want to drop the ceiling in the bedrooms below, so we've got some alternative framing going on. Um, and a little bit of a thermal... Um, bridge or basically just a little kind of zone of a slightly less uh, R value, which again is kind of accounted for in the model. Uh, typical roof detail there. Uh, now onto the windows. Um, certainly we're looking at Inertech, Euroline, Castadia, and there's actually a new window coming from Starline, uh, which is using a, I believe it's a, um, a Shuko uh, profile um, there who we're looking at and working with on the tendering at the moment and part of some value engineering. Um, for a medium, looking for a medium to low solar heat gain coefficient, again, trying to tackle that constant problem in Vancouver now of new passive houses of the overheating. Um, Multi-point locking um, and the key thing about how you locate that hardware to make sure you don't get any flex and bowing in the frames. Um, locally available windows, very important. Um, these ones in particular are now being made in the lower mainland, uh, the Starline ones that is, same as Euroline. Um, trying to limit the number of windows, like different sizes down to a minimum, try and keep, keep the cost down. Um, and again, using the different sizes in kind of the right locations, really trying to maximize both the views from living spaces, providing you know, a bit of privacy to the bedrooms, but a little bit of um, solar orientation for that. But most of that organization is driven by the site zoning, the client's unit count requirement. Um, whereas on single family, you get the opportunity to really uh, control the window locations based more on site and orientation. Um, the windows will be tilt and turn. 
uh, and again, using windows for the patio doors rather than using uh, entry doors. Um, trying to get flush thermally broken sills for the doors as a challenge. So uh, certainly looking at a couple of different options for that. Uh, and we're using interior blinds to uh, give you both privacy control and a little bit of solar control as well. Uh, so it's the standard um, sill detail for, I think at the moment this is detailed with the, uh, the Euroline frame, I think. <clears throat> Uh, and then a typical head detail on the side there with the blind box. And depending on the framing, you can either drop your, you know, either lift your blind box up into between the joists. Um, and the issue always being, you just want to make sure that your window can tilt back without it hitting that blind. Um, for the entry doors, this is detailed at the moment with the cowl door. Um, a great door, beautiful looking, pretty heavy, difficult, slightly difficult to get the clear opening because um, it is a big frame. Um, but again, we're now looking potentially at Starline for a, a, a modified version of their um, window frame to be used as a door. Uh, certification and air tightness testing. Um, this is just an example of one of our buildings, uh, one of the buildings on the site. I think this is the, um, yeah, the, uh, the detached unit on building one. So basically the worst case scenario one. <clears throat> for this project, as frustrating as it is for us, we do need to provide seven PHPPs because those are detached. They need to be counted as a separate buildings. Um, so we described it as four buildings, but really from PHPP, it's seven. Uh, we think it should be basically done as one whole project, but that's up for debate and for another, another, another meeting. Um, and so uh, really by looking at the challenges of this detached unit, um, it's we would slightly struggle on this one because it's the same fundamental plan mostly as the other as the other units adjacent to it, but it's got more exterior walls. So it's just not quite as efficient from a um, wall to volume area ratio. Um, mid air construction, uh, mid construction air testing. Um, the challenge is when do you do it? Um, speak with the contractor, figure out the schedule and the practicality of when you can do remediations. Um, again, we're going to test building uh, 1A and B on those detached units because they're the worst case scenarios with the most kind of steps and jogs and junctions. Uh, so we can learn the lessons from those buildings, uh, from that one building, and then apply it uh, to the others as we go through. Um, these are some diagrams that we put together for the passive house verification plan for the city of Vancouver, but they're also very useful just from a practical point of view for planning the project. You can kind of see how the, it indicates where the air barrier is, where the sweet to sweet air barrier is, and then where those openings are going to be formed. Uh, so the challenge with the townhouses is how do you connect them together because you've got to do it as a single building so you've got to find a location um, ideally somewhere where you can easily remediate the drywall or basically leave the drywall out and fill it in easily later so using things like storerooms um, and closets um, and of course it can happen in 3d as well because it's when you've got three stories stacked alongside each other with different layouts um, the basically the openings to link the buildings together can kind of do this quite a few plans involved for <laughs> mapping this out with them. Um, so in section, this is just like a quick diagram to indicate kind of where the blower door is going. Um, for the building one there, you can see on the top left corner, we're actually going to blow door test the top units and then the bottom units and they'll pressurize against each other. Um, and you can see those kind of blue squares indicating where those horizontal openings are going to be made between the suites. Um, obviously, 0.6 is the target, but you know, ideally, we'd like to try and hit something around 0.4. That's generally what we're seeing on most of our projects. Um, you want to make sure you're going to you're going to gang all those electrical penetrations together where you can through your envelope. Um, prep as many of your uh, penetrations as you can. Um, gasketing and tape sealing all your ducts um, for your air barrier. Uh, make mock-ups at difficult junctions if you can. Um, the adjustment of doors and windows is always seems to be a problem these days. Um, capping your HRVs. Um, uh, I just want to chuck this one in because Scott actually mentioned it a while ago and it seemed like quite a good idea. He thought about rather than creating those openings between the suites and having to make up the walls later, um, he thought the idea of potentially daisy chaining the HRVs together rather than capping them off so using a flexible piping to link one unit to the other as it goes, goes along. We probably won't do that, but it was an interesting one to explore. Um, other design features on the project, um, recirculation hood fans, uh, indu induction cooktops, uh, heat pump washer dryers, um, we've got load management uh, services applied to the electrical car charging because it's pretty extensive now. Um, we do have an electrical vault in lieu of a PMT. Um, the exterior elevator, uh, again, purely for access, but also useful because it's outside the thermal envelope, so it's simpler. Um, LED lighting, as you probably would in any project, but you know, worth noting. Um, 
and just some additional bike facilities and other uh, kind of social amenities that have been provided. Um, some lessons and things we'd like to kind of learn and challenges we dealt with. Um, the lock-off suites for this one in particular, um, acoustic and code issues generally related to separating lock-off suites from the rest of the suites. Um, can you even get doors that are STC 50 and 45 minute rated with closers? It's difficult. Um, and the whole kind of shared ventilation between the suites and if you need smoke dampers. Um, just the challenge of having stacked units, um, having cold spaces over heated spaces below and trying to create th uh, flush thresholds between them. Um, having a variety of different suites, as you've seen from all the different plans, it's kind of four completely different buildings all in one project. So it's just a lot of complexity. Um, and again, that creates lots of different ventilation uh, plan layouts as well to try and get your head around. Um, municipal challenges, of which there were quite a few. Um, it's perhaps a little over the top, but certainly we're trying to like trying to work with the municipalities to really focus on the important stuff and not the kind of small inconsequential issues. Um, for example, we ended up having, having to have a meeting to discuss one eighth of an inch of heights that were out over the envelope. And I mean, it does. I won't go on. Um, uh, the things about stepping, having to have this sixty percent rule at the fourth story, just means it makes your envelope very inefficient. Um, Again, the problem we had with the um, the DCL waiver and the the the, uh, the caps on it, and how it ended up cutting the building down and just really um, affecting the project really negatively. Um, the box storage rules in the city of Vancouver are a challenge, but that's not passive house, so I won't bore you with it. Um, same with accessibility, more VBL related, but again, challenges just trying to make suites efficient. Um, parking requirements still too high in our opinion, just always a problem. Um, the wall station exclusion policy, it's great, but we'd love to see it simplifies because it's we just spend a lot of time having to do the calculations on it and it's just too complicated. Really, it's just measure to the inside face of drywall, just a little bugbear. Um, this, the separation of the exhaust and the supplies comes up on every project. One consultant's happy having them together with the um, with louvers facing the opposite directions. Uh, others say, no, it's got to be the eight to 10 feet. So it's a kind of an ongoing battle. Um, the passive house criteria that we're struggling with a little bit as always, Great targets, but sometimes we just find some of the trying to hit those targets is a little detrimental to best practice from, an, from a construction and architectural point of view. Um, trying to compromise certain things to make sure we hit the 15 is always a little bit difficult. Um, refrigerants, using systems to try and achieve these high efficiency levels are great, but again, the risk of those, the global warming potential risk of those leaking. Um, the extent of thermal bridges, Sometimes when you've got a building that's big enough, do you really need to account for everyone? If you've got a headroom in your model, then you can probably, you know, you should be able to get, get away with it. Um, and again, the accuracy of trying to put the sheer amount of information in the PHPP is a challenge. And then looking at it as a whole and thinking, how much does this really impact the whole um, performance of the model? Um, lessons that we take forward, uh, etarting strategies, doing diagrams at an earlier stage for, for everyone to understand what you have to do um, and discussing it with the trades and the site supers. Um, ventilation and cooling, we typically do the diagrams ourselves now of just mapping out where we want to run the ducts, what sizing units will do. We'll typically do the flow rates, do a markup and then send it to our consultants. Um, always having headroom in the PHPP, be conservative in the early days. Uh, then when you get value engineering ch challenges later, uh, it just gives you headroom to still make it work. Um, overheating prevention, window sizes, shading strategies. We model them in-house, but just trying to accommodate those at an early stage is helpful. Um, we're looking forward to the future benefits of PHPP 10. I haven't had a chance to delve into it yet, but we gather there's some good things in the pipeline and that should help us. Um, value engineering, again, trying to deal with cost savings in this era of hyperinflation uh, and balancing that and getting your client to understand the fact you've gone passive house and you've gained 5% bonus in Vancouver. So trying to make sure those numbers still add up. Um, always simplify your building form, of course, we all know that here, but it's not always within our power to do it. The city defines most of that in the zoning. Um, and for us, certainly looking to use BIM more in the future and just improve that efficiency of using SketchUp like you saw in those images and 2D vector works. Um, and just a token gesture back to the city of Vancouver to say, we do have some challenges with the DP process, but we have had really, really great support by uh, from the um, green building and energy department really to solve lots of those issues and really break down barriers and really just help us achieve the buildings and make them kind of perform the way we think they should be done. A uh, couple, quick couple of images of our uh, other project. This is my other project, Lakewood Townhouse, with the same developer that's actually just across the street. They're both being designed and built at the same time. Um, this is Rupert, I believe. This is one we had the walkthrough of just last week, which is under construction. 
Um, this is another townhouse development of mine, which has just gone on hold because of the new uh, Broadway plan. It's probably going to be replaced with a 20 story tower, but again, a um, complicated stat, but uh, quite a nice townhouse development. Um, and then another one in the office that I'm working on, which is this uh, 7 to 80 Fraser Street, uh, which is a 100 unit rental um, plus 12 townhouses um, to their sort of a co development. Right. I think my throat is dry enough. I've probably gone on way too long. I've no idea what the time is, but thanks a lot. Sandra Lester, you have the first question and we'll uh, continue on with things. So let's go, Sandra. Um, I know that when you're working in the early stage of architecture, that it can be a little bit um, uh, challenging to do a parametric study in terms of window to wall ratios and looking at the right levels of insulation. Just wondering if you tackled that and then my second kind of off the ball um, question is uh, whether you use future weather files to project performance. Well, I mean, I think we uh, it's we're sort of at the point now, just us as an office that we've done enough kind of multifamily big passive house buildings where we just kind of know which systems work for us. And we kind of know that if we've got a six inches of insulation and a two by six wall, we know our R value is good enough. And unless we've gone bonkers with our windows, we know we're probably going to be OK. Um, so it's it, yeah, with big multifamily, you've got a bit more flexibility with you know, how that kind of fenestration is done. Um, but yeah, I think there's a certain amount of um, just prior experience that we just apply to each project. And it's, it's, it's certainly very different from doing a single family, for sure. Um, and sorry, I completely forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> Um, about future weather files, uh, are you guys using them? Oh, right. Um, yeah, I mean, is it that, that really fit for us? That really came up first for our project in Smithers that Scott and I worked on a couple of years ago with BC Housing. Um, when it wasn't too severe a summer here, not certainly not the heat dome, but uh, I think that was back in 2018 or 19. And the you know the model said it was going to be for whatever the average temperature was, and basically turned out to be about three or four degrees higher throughout the whole summer. And we had some we had some overheating problems on that project. And again, probably a combination of slightly over insulated walls. Had we had a bit more experience than a few more buildings, we probably could have reduced that down a little bit. Um, but again, the you know the, at the time the climate file was the current climate file didn't have any future climate data in the model. Um, and if we'd done that, that probably would have come back and you know, could have rung some alarm bells. But um, I know kind of Scott's looking at potentially using the uh, 2050 files just as um, kind of really a you know quality assurance testing really for it. Yeah, I think one of the things that's come out is the PHPP 10 has just come out and we're just exploring it now, but it does have uh, tests in it for weather, future weather files. It also has some uh, heat island effect uh, tests that you can do. And I, I had a long chat with Monty Paulson, whom a lot of people know, a couple of days ago. He's now become what he calls a climate change specialist. <laughs> Excuse me. And we are talking about uh, actually modeling uh, the heat dome file and actually requiring projects to have a look at that and just see how resilient projects are. And uh, it's, uh, you know, just part of what's going on, right? We just keep trying to uh, refine what we're doing and learn what we're doing and figure out what we're doing better. But Vancouver is now making uh, cooling mandatory in buildings and most buildings in Vancouver do not have cooling. That, that's It's actually pretty rare, uh, but it's now mandatory within the next couple of years. So uh, that's going to be a big challenge because now we're figuring out how to put heat pumps in. And um, I'm really liking the product, product called Inova in the U.S. It's called Epoca, Epoca. And I'm trying to get some modeling data on it for PHP, but having lots of trouble getting the manufacturer to step up. So anyways, but that's what we're up to. Yeah, and certainly, so I'll add, we, we, do, uh, we do use Design PH as well uh, to assist with uh, kind of early testing. Um, and certainly kind of on this project, I think I mentioned it there, but I might just sort of skip by it. But the um, you know, we are putting AC rough in into this project. And at the time of when we were getting the DP, it was acceptable as the overheating strategy. The model only shows 3% overheating. Um, but having that as a strategy of being roughed in and therefore easy for people to install is fine. But really, at the same time, in my mind, you know, we need to be really preventing and minimizing the risk of overheating from fundamental design rather than having to plug AC in to solve it. You know, um, so it's I mean, this building's quite well set up because you know, being run parallel like that, the, you know, the, the front building is quite well shaded by the south building. We've got big kind of cantilevered decks which shade the living spaces quite well. 
Um, and again, so we've, we've got we've got a reasonable amount of shading, um, but the AC there is just to kind of help that out. I think one of the big things we've got here, this building has all through units. It doesn't have your standard ex, uh, single, you know, mid, mid corridor with north units and south units or east west units and west units and no ability to have flow through ventilation. And it's pretty rare that you get a totally still day in a, on a warm evening in Vancouver. It will happen. It did happen during the heat dome. But uh, generally, I, I think these will be not too bad. The, the biggest issue will be the fact that First Avenue is a very busy street and uh, and and the, we have some bedrooms on that side which have some soundproofing in the windows, but you know you you might just open the window and live with the during those uh, few hot days and live with a bit of noise that may be what happens but all good good thoughts i mean this is what we have to be thinking about all the time now sandra i hope that answers your question because i again these uh, individuals experience at smithers project and uh, uh i know um we had albert uh, rooks running up there to get data on that smithers project and then we uh Monty talked about the uh, 1985. We went back to the future with that whole data file of how that file was outdated in uh, that particular project where it was a worst case of about five or six different things that came in to be quite a challenge. Um, we all learned early. And again, this is what's so great about this community sharing is we kind of all learned quickly that the data files were, uh, were wrong and need to be reviewed um, because of that Smithers project. So um, again, without that collaboration and openness from this community with Scott and, and the rest of the team that was involved, I mean, with Monty and what Albert did, it was some amazing research. Uh, and I think that presentation might be in the ZebEx folder and file. So it's, it's pretty good stuff. Um, all right, uh, we've got a couple more minutes just before we wrap things up for the first hour. Melvin, if you can ask one question and then we'll hold the next one until the, uh, until the overtime. So uh, Melvin. Sure. Um, so my question is, did you get an improved alternative solution for the Papa with the plumbings? And if you did, is that alternative solution publicly available for other consultants? So, so the answer is interesting. The PAPA, which if everybody doesn't know what we're talking about, we're talking about air admittance valves and we're talking about stopping the transfer of air through the plumbing stacks, which are in PHPP need to be modeled as the thermal bridge. And they can have about a one kilowatt hour per square meter per year effect on your model, uh, or unless you insulate them or something like that. But it, it's, it, it is significant enough that we need to think about it. So the manufacturer, manufacturer of these products, which is Studer, uh, has two basic components to the system. One is an air admittance valve, and the air admittance valve is designed to just let air in and not let air out, uh, which provides the ventilation, that you, the venting that you need in a plumbing system to make sure your traps stay full of water. Uh, and the normal way is you just run a pipe up to the roof and you let the air come in from the roof. So. They don't let us uh, do what they do in Europe, which is you put one of these air admittance valves underneath each uh, bathroom group. Like you have one end of the sink that does a whole bathroom and you have one in the kitchen that does anything in the kitchen. And you don't have venting through the roof. In Vancouver, we still vent through the roof, but they are allowing us to put an air admittance valve on the top of the top stack. So we put a bigger one up there. And they have accepted that quite honestly, because they could always peel it off and then it's a conventional plumbing system. So if it doesn't work, there's a solution, a real easy solution. So that's what they're allowing us to do. The pawpaw is, is like a, it's like a water hammer device. So when the water runs down the stack, you can get a, a shock wave. And the pawpaw is like a, like a hammer device that just is designed to take that shock away. They aren't letting us use that because it's not CSA approved. <laughs> so uh, despite the fact the manufacturer thinks we should put it in, they don't seem to need it in three and four story buildings, but they want it anything taller than that. Uh, Vancouver won't allow us to use it. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah. Well, um, that wraps up the first hour. We're going to dive into the happy hour uh, just shortly after I just make a few thank yous. Um, Scott and Gwil, thank you again for uh, for uh, um, hanging out with the first hour. Hopefully we will keep you on. I know uh, Scott's in his cabin, so he's got nothing to do and unless uh, the sun goes down. And so, yeah, those lovely trees behind Scott is not a Zoom background. That is live from uh, uh, Gambier Island, which is just a 45 minute ferry or, you know, sail 
from uh, from the Horseshoe Bay. Um, and Gwil is actually in Vancouver. The Northern Lights behind him doesn't oh, have to be legit. Vancouver. This is legit. I'm having an oh, amazing yeah, time. Yeah. He's, he would have to be in Edmonton to get that color. But uh, he's actually in, I, I guess you're in the office? Uh, you? No, I'm at home in kits. Okay. So at any point in time, you might hear a screaming baby, a cat or a dog. So well, fair enough. Okay. Well, we'll keep you as long as we can before uh, one of those three make you uh, leave us. Um, but again, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, hopefully everyone made note of the different events and the podcasts that are coming up. You can always check out all the information. And if you are a newbie uh, and you're not sure exactly some of the details you're talking about, you can go to the Passives Accelerator website and look at the, uh, the 101 so you can understand some of the basics, um, uh, details and principles that they spoke about. And, uh, and if you're looking for more of the events again on the accelerators uh, YouTube page, you'll see the last 200 years worth of uh, of events and uh, um, and so Scott and Gwil uh, are or sorry Scott's been back three times. I think he now holds the honor of uh, presenting the most on the accelerator and uh, uh, again as you've seen today, they've got a lot of projects that they have done and completed and uh, and the fact that he shares so much information to the community um it is great to have him back with the team so will thank you very much we're going to go back to questions and we're going to kick off the happy hour and we'll go back to melvin with uh, your second question yeah before i go into the second question uh sean you mentioned that uh, Will had a lot of slides, and I think about four years ago, we both presented at Perkins and Will, and I think I beat Will in the number of slides, and Killian, too. Ah, oh, that's not how oh. I remember it, but, you know. It's... Okay. I think we'll so, so... settle this over beers shortly. I think yeah. we can pull out and do a calculation. <laughs> go, ahead with your, go ahead with your question, though, right. uh, Melvin. So my second question is a bit longer. Um, did you consider a uh, live workspace in lieu of walk-up units? So I'm kind of asking this because I think we both worked on projects in Moodyville, which is a district in the city of North Vancouver, which required live work, but uh, walk-ups were also acceptable. And part two of my question, which is a bit selfish, is if you did have live work, would you consider having two 20 volt outlets um, in a workspace and how that would affect PER? Um, and these 220 volts can uh, power things like um, larger machineries for like hobbyists, um, like woodworking. And this might be a way to push away from uh, lower density single family houses into townhomes, which have similar amenities to single family. 240 volt would also mean the HRVs could run at their proper European designed flow rates, but. <laughs> I'll let Scott comment on the lockups, but I'm, I'm pretty sure. Well, I'll, I'll comment on the lockoffs. Uh, quite honestly, Melvin, the lockoffs were an opportunity discovered. So I put it that way as we designed the building and the developer just really saw it as a way to promote affordability in Vancouver. Uh, and, and there was quite a bit of interest. In fact, I believe uh, Rufi, uh, who presented at the at the uh, at the conference, the Pass Bus conference, or one of the mechanical consults, I believe her family has bought one of those with the lock off, uh, and I think she might be living in the lock off. I don't actually know, but I think that might be what's going on. But anyways, Vancouver is just a, such an unaffordable city. Those those units are probably selling for somewhere in the order of twelve hundred bucks a square foot, I would think, something like that. And it's such an unaffordable city that anything you can do to promote affordability is is needs to be done. And so that looked like an opportunity because it was easy to do. So that's kind of where it came from, Melvin. Yeah. Yeah, because those ground level suites have just got you know access directly onto First Avenue, so they can have their own entry door straight off the street. So yeah, was, and they have yeah, another entry door off the courtyard, so mm -hmm. it kind of it can work both ways. Yeah. 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 Yeah, great stuff. Um, I forgot who is up next, so let me just go back to that list. Uh, it is John over in Australia. John, how was your Thursday? Uh, it's just started. Thank you. Um, I've actually got three questions, so I'll pick two. Um, you may have covered it in the, in the drawings that I wasn't here. Um, the, you talk about the uh, separation of the resource and the extract of the HIV. 
they don't all seem the solution you have. So what did you actually do where you've got so many units and lots of money and you're trying to minimize the those types? How did you go about that? So in this project, we've actually got a we've got a mixture. We've kind of um where we've got this the HRVs in storage rooms, which back onto the exterior wall. We've got the supply going directly outside at ceiling level where the HRV is. And then internally within the storage room, I think also if it's in a closet as well, we're then running the duct vertically down because we've got nine foot ceilings, we can get around about eight feet separation. Um, so we literally just box it in and run the shaft down and then go out the exterior wall that way. Um, I'm trying to think on the, the other units are slightly different we, well i don't think on this one i think in the end we, we we didn't settle on being able to use the um scott i think you know the name of the product but we do have a sample in the office of a grill um that again brings the ducts out parallel and it has these bi-directional little louvers that allows them to do this basically um but uh, i don't think we're using that on this one then. we didn't provide any they were all individually uh supply sorry i couldn't make out the rest of your question there sorry so you didn't combine any of the extraction uh, pipes there? No, no, no. They're all just each each individual suite is dealt with as it as it, as itself, yeah, individually. Um, and our second one, um, I didn't quite see it, but you may have in one of mentioned that the, the the thermal break in the balcony is a product to ensure that the outside. Uh, that connection was, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm trying to remember how we're, how we're framing it. Um, I think uh, we've basically, what we typically do is we try to, we'll, we'll try to uh, cancel either out um, two PSLs or something like that. Um, and therefore we'll minimize the you know, thermal bridge to just two points. Um, again, for air barrier as well, it just means you're only having to tape around two, two beams as opposed to having you know, all the joists running out. Um, so two primaries heading out, and then we'll put uh, cross um, framing um, once it's out, once it's outside the building. Um, so where they can to leave, that's the case. Um, the the other ones, I didn't really get a chance to talk about it, but you probably saw where those exterior stairs were. We have those kind of um, we have the roofs as well that cover them because it's Vancouver. We need rain protection. Um, unfortunately, there the only way we could frame it was by having these ledger beams. And the ledger beams do run basically the length of the connection to the building. And uh, effectively, the um, it's a pretty big beam that basically sits within the two by six insulation. Um, so that is a thermal bridge that we've had to model. And we've got to make sure we detail that properly with making sure the weather barrier kind of kicks in around it and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's a tricky little detail, but there was no other way to structurally make it work. So. One of the cautions is uh, when you decide to cantilever a beam out, you got to make sure it's a one piece beam. If you use a multi piece beam, you've got that gap in the middle that there's no way to air seal it, right? So, and we've had multi, we've we spec'd one piece beams and then we go to the site and there's a multi piece beam. And we've had that happen a couple of times. And then we have to make them tape the top and bottom of the beam way out to try to deal with the 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 air gap that's between the beams uh, i've also seen a detail where they drill a little tiny hole in the gap and then caulk it i've seen that detail to solve that problem but that's one you got to watch for and then we have another project where they we designed it that way and they decided to frame it with all the joists going out and decided to tape around every single one of them so you know like you know you just don't know sometimes sometimes stuff happens and <laughs> if you're not on site when it happens it, you just got to make them fix it. So that that stuff happens all the time. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Can I do my third one, Sean? Um, Go for it, John. In, in Australia, we've hopefully this sounds better now. Um, um, in Australia, we are being directed by our fire authorities to upgrade the um, uh, air treatment, water supply, water pressure. Uh, the minute we put uh, EV charges in an underground car park. Um, the fire, it's, it's odd. Our building code says petrol and diesel cars are treated the same. However, when the fire go, when an EV goes up, it's twice as hot, twice as long, three times as long, and the gases off it are pretty nasty. And so we're seeing upgrades being directed and wall thicknesses and other things. 
wondering whether that's an experience that's happening in other multiverse projects like this or anywhere underground. That's interesting. That has not come up yet in Vancouver uh, on anything we've done. Now, our, our parkades are typically one and a half hour separation, but reality, they're two hour. The way we design them, they're usually a minimum eight inches of concrete with enough cover to the reinforcing that we have a two hour wall and a two hour slab. So, and usually a, a 90 minute rated door. So it hasn't come up, uh, but that's interesting. That, that is interesting. It has not come up though. Yeah, John. I'll, I'll share, I'll share okay. on the chat, the chat uh, some research that's happening here. Uh, you might people might be interested in. Um, but when they they don't burn very often, but when they do, they're long and hot. And um, yeah, we're being we're seeing quite a bit of change in the way that they treat it. I think it's four hours, not two. So it's, uh, it's big big changes. Uh, yeah, the, interesting, John. Um, I know Leighton, who is uh, involved with the city of Vancouver, is listening, but I think he must be uh, working hard and, and not uh, dialing it. I otherwise I'd ask him, but um, I know that uh, in about a month's time, we're going to do a bike tour here in Vancouver and we're going to get to go to the first Passive House Fire Hall. Um, and that'll be one of the first things I ask uh, the chief there, what his thoughts are of electric cars and get his input. So um, this is why it's great about this community. You never thought that electric car would burn hotter and longer than a a gas car but you know these are the things that people are looking at so uh great stuff um thanks john uh again um you owe me for letting you ask more questions because there is a long queue and uh peter is next peter over to you john, the yeah, i'm just wondering did you include any bike racks on the property for scoring extra points uh yeah sorry i realized i <laughs> i didn't actually put up a copy of the parkade plan mainly because it's covered in bikes um and in the city of vancouver we have a, a transport demand management plan um and to summarize it's a nightmare but basically it's got some good principles behind it you know to get your parking count your vehicle parking count down you can provide up to i can't remember now 40 percent um, extra parking and you get points and you tally the points up and then you basically get to reduce your cars um in this particular project we were kind of hamstrung with the amount of parkade space um, available. Um, I wish I'd shown a parkade plan because actually the the the, two, the building two in that southwest corner that is on grade, and the southeast corner building four is also on grade. Um, and that was because we were just trying to minimise the amount of excavation because you know, every time we go down and dig out, it's just costing us more money. Um, and just try, we just basically did a trade off between what's the best way to do it, try and get our parking count down or excavate more. So we had space to get the bikes in. Um, and then in addition to extra bikes, we've also got things like um, a bike workstation, a bike, bike repair workstation, cleaning station, that kind of stuff. Um, and all those things contribute to points. So we've got kind of a lot of that below grade in the parkade, but we also have visitor, visitor bikes at grade at the entries and things like that. So, yeah. So I think Peter was um, joking because we know our good friend Mark always talks about lead and and, and bike racks. Um, now, but just to just to clarify again, is lead versus passive house compliancy for this? Was there a lead or was it just passive house? Just passive house. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I was waiting for Mark to chime in in the chat about some bike racks, but I think he's holding his teeth, which um, this could be the first folks. Sorry, I, I feel like that's an inside baseball discussion that I haven't been party to. But I, no, no. Uh, again, some of us that have been around lead, you know, always kind of mocked the fact of you get you get uh, points for uh, bike racks. Um, and you know, what you, we what we can do, Sean, though, in Vancouver is we can get points that allow us to reduce the parking for bike racks. And and I, did we do that, Will, on this one? Did we do a trans yeah, yeah. So that was what I maybe I didn't explain it very clearly, but yeah, if you basically provide extra bike parking over the minimum requirement, then you get to if you get enough of them, then you could reduce the amount of uh, vehicle parking spaces. So, yeah. <laughs> so now the chat's going to fill up with uh, lead requirements and, uh, and points. But we'll we'll continue on with password stuff. Um, thanks, Pete. Uh, I, that again allowed me to chuckle. Um, James Marshall, I believe. Kim, answer your question. Yes, it should be up on the uh, uh, YouTube channel um, Monday or Tuesday, depending how fast we are. Um, James, did you have any other questions or is that how take care of you? 
Um, this isn't the James Marshall that's our that we're doing a passive house for right now, is it? <laughs> it's always nice to have clients on, and we can we always need more clients wanting passive houses. So James, if that is you, I think he is left, but uh, um, that's great. Yeah. Gotta, lo gotta love it. Uh, which uh, client is um, is James Scott? Which project is? We're it's a little six unit townhouse project that we're hoping to do with. Uh, with with actually a hot water based or a water based distribution system from the heat pumps. So with space pack and Sandins, it's only six units. Um, yeah, nice, nice, interesting little project. To tell you the truth, and the, it'd be one we will present the technical side maybe sometime if once we get it over the over the line. But James Marshall, James Marshall actually was the director of a bunch of. Uh, uh, movies and stuff that we all have seen so yeah oh very cool okay great <laughs> you remember we around, he did, he did yeah, small we showed around the rupert project last week yeah 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 very cool okay great uh next in the queue is uh Ratko, and i see that you're still here Ratko, over to you hit that lovely mute button Ratko, and you can go ahead and ask your questions oh he's working on the technical the technology and the technique <laughs> Hello. There we go. We can hear you. Okay. Sorry about that. So the way um, I, I was just hoping to see that um, overall envelope slide that was shown up before um, on that project. Uh, great project. Very interesting project. Which building did you want to see, Radko? Which of the it, was, it was very early. It was one of the first slides or very early in the slides, probably within the first 10 slides, there was a, an overall envelope, um, air barrier envelope. Oh, sure. Yeah, I know the one. Um, give me one second here. <clears throat> is there something in particular that you were interested in on that slide um uh well uh, how, how did the um the build what was the sort of the builder's uh view on 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 the complexity of it uh trying to get that envelope tight did they have many issues with it or um um you know was there anything that had to be redesigned we will find out. Uh, the The building is just being tendered right now, and uh, it, it, there there are all these complications on these. And we often do see a couple of changes as we do mock ups. But um, we've this is close to a strategy we've done before. It's always the balconies and cantilevers and stuff, and uh, sometimes parking garage. If you got park uh, garages in townhouses, those are really tough. But yeah. 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 In this instance, because yeah. the way you know, they're, they're all sitting straight on a concrete parkade, it's really just a case of making sure if you, your plywood is taping and sealing down correctly on top of your concrete and you're pre stripping where you need to. And it's, uh, we think this is probably one of our simpler air barriers. We've done quite a few, pro well, I guess quite a few. Uh, we did our Smithers project up north and the original um, ski uh, on Skeena Street, the Heights, with the what we called the Scott Wall that was uh, two by six structural wall with between two and six inches of EPS with a polymer face. And it was the polymer face on the inside that was then taped together to make that air barrier. And then you had a service cavity inside that. And certainly on the Smithers passive house, I think we achieved 0.34 air tightness on that. And in hindsight, that was a slightly complicated air barrier, but it did work really well for different junctions in terms of how the insulation wrapped around things. Um, and there's again, the same on the, um, the Heights project. So we figure if that can hit 0.34, then this is this we think is quite a lot simpler so we're pretty confident yeah, yeah I think the other thing just to think about is the way we do we're finding the best way to do the parkade floor that the, the ceiling of the parkade is to do a split insulation system so we insulate both above and below uh, and that way you, your thermal bridges are are not too bad right if you have a curb or whatever you have uh it's still got about half of its insulation on one side or the other so it's, it's actually works pretty well um, and that's a strategy that I, I really strongly believe in. Every time we've tried to do it with just insulation below, we end up with problems that we just can't solve. Like we just can't figure out how to solve them. And uh, so when we go up and uh, above and below on the parkade, I don't know if even Will's got a parkade slab. Well, I guess that's close, but uh, yeah. Anyways, that's kind of what we've found. Mm. Excellent. No, good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, the, again, the level of details 
um, that you guys have done in the past is amazing. But again, the fact that you have, I think you just talked about the, the seven PHP models you had to do for this particular project is, <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, I said, and even those organized. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll add as also the, um, the, hopefully people notice those, um, those exterior stairs that we had separating the buildings that were a bit of a pain, but um, that could be a real nightmare from a, you know, water and air barrier point of view because the way they connect to the buildings but um working with uh london mar our friend jib over there who's brilliant knows his stuff um we we ended up figuring out a system where we could basically have a freestanding steel structure that sits off by a couple of inches from the stucco finish and it just is on posts and connects to so basically bolt it onto curbs on the concrete parkade and just build it independently of the building um, so that way it, it eliminates your thermal bridging and just makes it a lot simpler. So that in itself, I really wanted to put that detail up, but it's still kind of in, in flux at the moment while we figure it out. But um, a couple of tricks like that to really you know, separate those things and eliminate that as a problem in the first place is kind of a, a good way to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I go on. I think this is a good point too, is we will try to have you guys back for construction tech because a lot of the details you talked about tonight could easily be in a construction tech and to, to have the builder's input and, and actually how some of these details get created is uh, is going to be really cool to see. Um, so yeah, so keep documenting lots of good stuff. Oh, so Leah, yeah, Layton is here. Oh, so yeah, interesting, Layton. We'll, uh, we'll get you back later on talking about the battery explosion so interesting um carry on sorry i'll come back to the chat. <laughs> sorry uh natalie or sorry not natalie N natalia natalie. <laughs> thank you sorry i i just caught the eye and it's fine oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so my question was uh, in one of the last uh, slides, you mentioned uh, uh, BIM, to use BIM for uh, documenting or maybe even designing. Uh, is it, it was over SketchUp and Vectorworks or, uh, or it was the other way around? <laughs> like you recommend yes. something like Revit, for example. Well, wow. it's, it's sort of a, yeah, we're traditionally as an office, we've worked years ago, we did 3D vector works and it is beneficial from a, when you're making changes further down the line, um, but it is a little clunky and it was kind of hard work and we had graphical issues with actually outputting good quality drawings that the site could read. Um, so about eight or so years ago, we basically abandoned doing that and went back to using traditional 2D vector works. Um, and then annoying people like myself who like using SketchUp started really designing our buildings in SketchUp. And you know, you do a massing study and then you start adding a bit of detail, then your client suddenly is like, oh, this looks great. How does how does that really work? And you're like, okay, let's explore it. And then my design mind goes crazy and I start adding more detail and more detail. And then at the end of the day, I mean, you basically end up with, you know, effectively, you know, a complete 3D of the whole project. The problem is it's kind of dumb because it's just polygons and geometry. There's no inbuilt data, you know? Um, yes, there are ways to import things like SketchUp models into Vectorworks and you can get Vectorworks to figure out what's a floor and what's a roof, but it's messy and it really doesn't work that well. So we're actually experimenting on uh, another, a new project in the office, might be a passive house, we'll see, but um, of, of using the latest version of Vectorworks 2022, um, which has far better 3D capabilities than the, maybe 2009 version we used years ago. Um, so we, we're kind of recognizing the, the, the benefits of all those smart tools and it has elements of, it basically is BIM, but it's just the Vectorworks version and it still shares the same data sets. I forget what's called IFC, I think it is, um, for, the, uh, for the data within symbols and stuff like that to be shared. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really the way we're going. Um, this kind of, you know, great as a design tool, but um, it has its limitations. So that's probably, this will probably be, you know, in a couple of years, this will just be SketchUp will just be a, a sketching, literally a sketching tool, probably. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So very cool. Uh, Leighton sent me a photo of the blast. That's what, if you're wondering what I put into the chat, um, that was uh, from one of the projects that had a bike, uh, bike explosion with the lithium battery. So thanks Leighton. Um, okay, moving on to Jason. Jason, you still with us? Didn't check. Uh, yes. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. 
Um, what's the reason for the recent move from the Scott wall to exterior insulation? Oof. <laughs> Multifaceted <laughs> that one. Um, <laughs> no. It's there, I just think there, there are pros and cons to both. Um, the Scott wall really was kind of the first passive house wall that Scott came up with. Um, it made a lot of sense on that first building. It really helps deal with complicated details and junctions of where concrete's getting introduced. And, you know, it, it means you've got insulation in two planes and they can kind of go past things and help firmly isolate, uh, isolate thermal bridges. Um, but I don't know. I think it's the, it depends on the project on, you know, that's, <laughs> I hate that answer of saying it depends, but uh, it has pros and cons on each one. I think it is, it's a worthwhile exercise if you've got a good contract or a good developer who has, you know, good knowledge of framing and understands, you know, ideally has taken the trades course, you know, knows what an air barrier is and how it needs to be applied and um, really sketching out those details in those early stages, you know, figures out which wall is the best way to go. And we might look at two or three, but you don't need to go that far down the road with you know with it before making a decision. Just you know, sketch out the simple ones, the you know the, the balcony deck details, um, stair details, parquet junction details, and your roofs and things like that. And you know, look at your windows, how you want to mount your windows, where it is in your thermal plane. Um, and yeah, there's 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 quite a few ways to, to skin a cat, but um, we think this is the right one for this one. Um, I don't know if Scott wants to add anything about his wall, if there was anything else he wants to. Well, I was going to say that the, the reason we went to the wall the first time, it was the very first passive house. It was a builder who had never, never done it before. And we were hang, hanging brick on the outside of the building. And so the advantage of having that was we had our structure right on the outside of the building. And we just hung the brick off it, no big deal. And uh, we actually created thermal bridge uh, bridge connections where wherever we had steel connecting to the to the concrete by just putting a one inch block of plywood in the gap and it was a very simple set of ideas to try to get the first one across the line uh, and and it worked but we felt that the labor was probably higher than it needed to be and a lot of our envelope guys really would prefer to see us keep the the sheathing warm and now we've been monitoring, we actually do have some instruments in that building. Uh, I haven't looked at them for a couple of years now, but everything seemed to be performing fine. So we still think it's a very viable option. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of movement to exterior insulation. And so we're looking at that as well. And uh, like I was just talking to Kevin Brennan on the chat, we just blew silos on a big project we're doing at Witset, and uh, we just blew that and uh, we, we were requiring three PSF and we got three pounds per cubic foot and we got about 3.77 was the one measurement that I got so uh, they blew it plenty dense so although we did get the mento uh, warping just a little bit Sean when they packed that much so it touches the back of the siding but anyways it's I, I up there it's fine yeah yeah I know it, it definitely happens that's why you see a lot of times the cross strapping or just thicker um, Pring strips just to, to deal with it because the Mento is 20% expansion. So it uh, it yep. can happen. Kevin's happy. It's good. Yeah, um, actually, sorry, I was just thinking that I had flashbacks to Passive House courses that will um, actually when we were in um, uh, Oakland. And I remember, I think uh, maybe it was RDH or somebody, I think maybe gave a, gave a presentation that was when they'd got done all the data on the um, stainless steel and the galvanized screws. Um, and really showing the the structural analysis they'd done of the pulling um, on those screws because a lot of people were worried that you know putting two by four strapping on the outside of six inches of insulation um, back through was going to be hard because can you hit the stud and is it okay to just hit the plywood and things like that of having that data I think has, has maybe um, pushed us a bit towards that particular wall now because um, it, it was it was still being questioned back in the day when we first looked at that. Great, thanks. Well, and I think now, I mean, you guys have done a number of buildings with a whole bunch of different wall types. And so uh, it's it's pretty interesting to see, you know, how things happen. And I think, you know, since I was helping out the owner early on, um, I think they just were happy with that foam wall and, uh, and kind of, you know, pushed you guys a little bit to that too. So sometimes it's, it's the full team that dictates the wall type, not just uh, you guys. So uh, interesting stuff. Um, there was a lot of stuff that you guys went through. I do have a couple of questions. Um, one for you, Scott, is the whole time to tap 
with uh, good old friend Gary Klein, um, with the system that you have, is that also something that you look into a well about, you know, making sure that homeowners get hot water quickly compared to, uh, and do, do you actually worry about the time to tap? That's a very, very interesting question because we are dealing with it on a couple of projects. So in this particular case, uh, I think well, we all have, we have uh, manifolds, right? And then they've yeah. got home runs from the manifolds. I'm not convinced that's the best way, but that is the way that a lot of plumbers like to plumb the building. So we have hot water research right at the manifolds. Uh, the one thing I've been wondering about, we insulate the line to the manifold, but we don't ever insulate anything leaving the manifold and, or we don't insulate the manifold. And I always, I've been wondering as I look at that on a couple of projects, whether we should require, you know, four or five feet of insulation from the manifold because the manifold is going to always be hot. Uh, and, and so I, it's got to be losing a little bit of heat, but you know, that's not something it, like if it was a hot water tank, you're required to go about 10 feet along the hot water line from the tank. I think under, even under ASHRAE to insulate that hot water line. So I've been wondering about that this last couple of weeks. Uh, and then we do have one townhouse project where we have, heat pumps, individual hot water tanks sitting in the parkade. This is one out in Coquitlam. And the time to tap is going to be fairly long there because they're, you know, they're back in the parkade. There's like putting them in the basement of a three-story townhouse. So I am a little bit concerned about exactly that issue there and wondering, uh, wondering whether we do a little, I've heard of a system where you can put a little research pump way up in the farthest fixture. Uh, and uh, I haven't specced it, but I'm wondering whether that would be a solution for those kinds of things. Yeah. Well, yeah, it might be a might be a call to Gary that you need to do. But hey, in my shower now that I've learned it's 40 seconds in my shower, so I literally could water all my plants and the outdoors to uh, to deal with that. So I just do that whole cold water, uh, um, you know, stress where you hop in and you get the cold water, you wake up, and then finally the hot water comes on. So. The cold's better for the muscles, right? So it's yeah, uh, yeah, it's totally for that. It's it's you know, some people choose coffee, some choose cold water showers, depending on your time lap. So it, it is one of those things. Um, question for you, gentlemen: When is the mock-up get built, or uh, is the mock-up still the sales center? Uh, good question. Um, <laughs> it's I don't know to be totally honest. Um, most of the time, it's kind of once they've got a once the parkade is done and they've got a spot to build something in a good clean environment then they'll put it together um and we'll have kind of discussions at the mobilization meeting about you know what details uh we think they should focus on and maybe they'll come back and say you know we think th this one looks okay we're not worried about it but this one we should look at um to be honest, we've always ever since you know you guys did a great job on those bcit mock-ups that really kind of set the standard for what those passive house mock-ups should be um and we have we had one in our office just the other week i don't even know which project it was from it just turned up and it's like here's a passive house wall with a passive house window and it's got some nice details and it's it's great it's great because it's just a really good tool to show people so um yeah i'm just waffling i don't really know if i answered your question or not <laughs> no no all good and, and i again is uh i know that the library at, at bcit has grown too much but i mean if you ever uh need space for my i could convince alex to dump them in there because uh the one that you guys had for Fraser and 57th was a real good one too for, um, for like that size. And um, even the one that Adam James did at the, uh, the daycare where it was pretty much like a four foot by four foot by six foot section of like every detail, you know, including parapets was, was pretty, pretty crazy. Um, but again, the, the amount of details and the amount of buildings you guys have in this particular project, I think it must break even the, um the uh moodyville the fee, the fee budget yeah well there's 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 that definitely <laughs> that too but uh, i i uh i tell you um i mean that being said, my client on this call i don't know well no he wouldn't be but that's okay um but but that being said too is um you know again the complexity of this like you know now you guys have done some big you know uh multifamily projects and this one here where it's it's not the same details like the one in moodyville the p um sorry evolve 45 of all the, the big 35. I mean, that, that was five units, but it was very similar. Now you have five buildings that are completely different. Like how do you as architects, you know, manage that now? Cause 